So we're going to begin because we have limited time and a lot of uh, exciting uh, uh, things to talk about. And uh, so we'll start now. And people can continue to get pizza. And please take your seats. And uh, we, will, uh, we will be underway. So today we're going to talk about the last Supreme Court term, which was yet another exciting one. Uh, and we have a, uh, an all-star panel uh, here to talk about uh, the, the term. Uh, we'll start with Professor Intasar Rab, uh, who's a specialist in Islamic law and in statutory interpretation. She'll talk about uh, the high-profile statutory cases from this term. She'll be followed by Professor and former Solicitor General uh, Charles Freed, a constitutional law and contracts expert uh, who will talk about some of the cases involving the political process. Uh, Professor Tomiko Brown-Nagin, uh, an award-winning legal historian and a constitutional law expert, will discuss some of the recent anti-discrimination cases. Uh, she'll be followed by Professor John Coates, who uh, teaches and writes about Constitution, uh, corporate, and I was on a roll on constitutional law there, uh, corporate and securities law, and we'll say some surprising things about the court's recent business cases. And then we will be joined in progress by Professor Dick Fallon, who is teaching a class uh, that ends at noon, and he will join us and talk about some administrative law uh, and federal courts questions, um, and uh, which uh, he's a, a specialist in constitutional law and federal courts. Um, what you'll see today is um, that there is a theme that cuts across these talks. There's a question about how much what the court is doing is sort of neutral, apolitical, one might even say boring legal craft, right? And how much of it is influenced and shaped by the judge's uh, political or policy values. You'll see a variety of viewpoints on this question. I think it'll be very interesting. Uh, we're going to ask people to talk five to eight minutes. I will uh, clear my throat or hold up my hand at seven minutes uh, and, uh, and ask people to, to stop at eight. If all goes well, we'll have, and if I stop talking, uh, we'll have some time at the end for questions. Uh, so without further delay, uh, we'll start with Professor Rapp. Great. Thank you, John. <clears throat> so I'll talk about statutory interpretation. And I'll focus specifically on the criminal law cases. Lest you think that's too obscure, know that statutory interpretation cases accounted for 25% of the court's docket last term, and the criminal law cases were half of that. And lest you think that too boring, know that last year's term involved cases of a jilted wife who poisoned her newly pregnant best friend. And the justices invoked references to iPhones to poison goldfish and to the horse head that Jack Waltz found in bed compliments of Vito Corleone in that famous scene from The Godfather. I kid you not. But, but on a serious note, I think these statutory interpretation cases vividly reflect the really central debates about how to interpret text versus purpose, letter versus spirit, structure versus values. So my main point is this, the Supreme Court is moving away from textualism and statutory interpretation cases where there are contested values amongst the justices in a particular case or arc of cases. And to demonstrate what I mean, I'll talk about two cases mainly, Abramsky versus the United States and Bond versus the United States. And I'll make brief reference to a third case, Barrage. So Abramsky. Mr. Bruce Abramsky bought a gun for his uncle, Angel Alvarez, and in answer to the federal form asking whether he was the actual transferee or buyer of the gun, he said yes. The form clearly warned in bold letters and in all caps that if he was buying the gun on behalf of someone else, he was not the actual purchaser. He was convicted for making a false statement on a federal form about a fact material to the lawfulness of the gun sale, and the court upheld the conviction on a 5-4 vote. The majority opinion by Justice Kagan pointed to the dual purpose of the statute. One, to protect, to prevent guns from being sold to criminals, and two, to assist law enforcement in investigating crimes. That purpose would be defeated if such straw purchases were allowed. In dissent, Justice Scalia said the defendant should have been let, uh, the, the conviction should have been overturned on textualism grounds. He posed the following hypothetical. 
If I give my son $10 and ask him to go to the store to go get buy milk and eggs, no English speaker would say that the store sells the milk and eggs to me. Justice Kagan responded with her own hypothetical. If I send my brother to the Apple store with money and instructions to purchase an iPhone, and then I take immediate and sole possession of the device, am I the person who bought the phone, or is he? Nothing in ordinary English language uh, usage compels an answer either way, she said. So Justice Scalia thinks that's absurd. It's puzzling, he says, to suggest that the answer would, dif would be different if the sale involved consumer electronics instead of groceries. For him, ordinary usage should have decided the case, as most people think of the buyer as the one at the counter conducting the transaction. And if there were any ambiguity, surely the court should have applied the rule of lenity, a really old canon of construction that directs courts to construe any ambiguities in criminal statutes in favor of the defendant. In response to his further accusation that the majority was engaged in mere purpose-based consequentialist reasoning, Justice Kagan said, it's not purpose-based. We simply recognize that a court should not interpret each word in a statute with blinders on. Which I have to say, I agree. Uh, she was saying that the interpretation of text must be attentive to context and that certain values might lead the court to use some textual canons to trump the strict dictates of others. Justice Kagan got the last word since the case went her way. The court upheld the conviction on a 5-4 vote. As I noted, the vote was split along ideological lines, liberals in the majority, conservatives in the dissent. But not all cases line up so neatly. So let's look at Bond. So Bond is probably best framed uh, by Justice Scalia in his dissent. And it's in a way that you might expect to be said in a really deep voice at the beginning of a Hollywood movie trailer. Somewhere in Norristown, Pennsylvania, a husband's paramour, that's mistress for those of you don't, who don't know, <laughs> suffered a minor thumb burn at the hands of a betrayed wife. The United States Congress has made a federal case out of it. What are we to do? <laughs> End of trailer. So clearly, I'm, I'm not James Earl Jones, but I think you get the point. So a few more facts. Ms. Carol Bond was a microbiologist who found out that her husband and her best friend were having a baby. And apparently you don't want to get on the bad side of a microbiologist. She had access to harmful chemicals that she smeared on the, the house doorknob, the car doorknobs, and the mailbox of her, well, now former friend. And she caused some minor injuries. The wife was prosecuted for using a chemical weapon under a 1998 Chemical Weapons Act that implemented a 1997 treaty ratified in the, in the wake of the first Iraq war when the concern was about terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. So the case could have gone one of two ways. First, there were these big constitutional questions following on from questions about individual standing under the 10th Amendment from an earlier iteration of this case two terms ago, did Congress have the power under Article I, Section 8, the Necessary and Proper Clause, to pass a law that would reach powers ordinarily reserved to the states, that is, police power over ordinary criminal law, and did its treaty power authorize it to pass the law in the first place? And was that law to be seen as per se valid, as held by a 1920 Supreme Court case, Missouri versus Holland? But second, there was also a really narrow statutory interpretation question. Was the, was the toxins, or was the toxin that Ms. Bond used a chemical weapon within the meaning of the statute? So in a 9-0 opinion on the judgment, the court addressed only the narrow statutory question. Justice Roberts, for the majority, which included Justice Kennedy and the four liberals, said that the ordinary meaning of chemical weapons does not cover these acts, the acts of a romantic jealousy. He further said that the court would not presume that Congress intended to infringe upon state sovereignty without a clear statement. He concluded that the statute didn't apply to Ms. Bond, so he saw no need to reach the constitutional question. In their concurring opinions, uh, Justice Scalia and the remaining conservatives would have addressed the constitutional questions. Declaring the, st the statute unconstitutional and overruling Missouri versus Holland altogether. On the statutory interpretation question, Justice Scalia complained that the text was clear, even if sweeping, 
but the majority's decision rendered it ambiguous. So according to the majority, he said, poisoning a goldfish tank is apparently out. That's not reached by the statute. But what if the fish belongs to a congressman or a governor, and the act is meant as a menacing message, a small time equivalent of leaving a severed horse head in bed? <laughs> but again, Justice Scalia lost the argument. As it did in Abramski, the majority read the statute according to its ordinary meaning in the context of other canons about statutory purpose, federalism, and constitutional avoidance. So deciding between contested values amongst the justices, it read some canons to trump others. So to conclude, it seems to me that the contested values at stake amongst the justices in each case or arc of cases guide their approach to interpreting statutes. It's in these cases, the court's approaches and their outcomes do not necessarily split along ideological, liberal, conservative lines. It did in Abramski. It didn't in Bond, and there was unanimity in a third case, Barrage, where the court um, held Justice Scalia writing for the court on purely textualist grounds to say that a sentencing enhancement for distributing drugs resulting in death requires but for causation and that the rule of lenity applies if any ambiguity remains. So instead of seeing them as solely statutory interpretation questions about criminal law, Abramski and Bond can be seen as contests about the size and scope of the federal government's power to regulate uh, here gun violence and ordinary crime. So I'll end with the point with which I began. The court increasingly adheres to textualism and statutory interpretation cases, but only when its members agree on a set of substantive values and it departs from textualism whenever there are significant and contested values at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rabb. We, we will now hear. Uh, We will now hear from Professor Fried about the political process. Professor Fried. In the 70s and 80s, 1970s, 1980s, uh, the court on a number of really hot button difficult issues reached what I would call a kind of settlement, which lasted. Uh, that was true in abortion. That was true in affirmative action, as we will hear from Tamir. Uh, uh, that was true in the death penalty. The settlement, however, was in each case incoherent, doctrinally vulnerable, somewhat illogical. Uh, but it represented the position where the country more or less was on all of those issues. Now I want to talk about another such settlement issue, campaign finance. Uh, after Watergate uh, in 1971 and then most strenuously 1974, uh, the Federal Election Campaign Act placed strict limits on contributions to federal campaigns and on expenditures by federal candidates. That means that a campaign can only spend so much money. What a blessing that would be. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and strict limits <coughs> on the amount of money by those supporting can, candidates. In 1976, uh, Buckley against Vallejo uh, came out with what I would call the illogical, uh, <laughs> unstable, but reasonable settlement. Uh, on one hand, there were people who said uh, that limits on contribution, uh, uh, well, on one hand, there were people who said that the political process, and uh, Justices uh, Scalia and Thomas are very much of that view now and, and articulated that the political process above all else should be beyond legislative regulation because those legislators are the ones that the political process is supposed to discipline and choose. On the other hand, there are those who say that in every other uh, developed democracy, uh, 
campaigns and campaign expenditures are under rigorous limitations, both the expenditures, the amount of money that can be spent, and the contributions. Those are the two extreme positions. What the Supreme Court said in <coughs> Buckley was that limits on contributions are perfectly constitutional. No problem. In order, and this is the phrase, to avoid <coughs> corruption or the appearance of corruption. Uh, however, expenditures by candidates or by independent groups or persons, uh, think the Koch brothers, uh, not connected with candidates are fully protected right up to the hilt by the First Amendment. So, you need to only read your newspapers to have a sense of how unstable that compromise position is and how illogical it is. And there have been justices from the beginning who have been pointing out the instability and illogic, the, the lack of logic of these, contribu uh, uh, these distinctions. Nonetheless, uh, the major lines of that settlement have held, have held, and held ever since <coughs> 1976. <coughs> Until this term in the McCutcheon case, which dealt with a limitation not on the amount of money you can give to each particular federal candidate, but on the overall amount of money you can give to all federal candidates. Mr. McCutcheon, a very rich uh, businessman from Alabama, wanted to give $1,776, note that, uh, to every candidate, Republican candidate, running for federal office anywhere in the country. Well, that vastly exceeded the limit. And that limit has been in place, as I say, since 1976, and not questioned since 1976. The Roberts Court said that limit is unconstitutional because uh, it, it, it bears no relation to the notion of, of uh, corruption or the appearance of, of corruption. Well, uh, it was demonstrated, indeed, a very conservative panel of the uh, District of the District of Columbia Circuit said, if you can do that, if you can give all this money to PACs and so on, then if you do it well enough, that could get up to three million dollars. The, the, the limit on individual contributions is twenty-five hundred. Three million dollars to the candidate of your choice. To which Justice Alito in uh, uh, oral argument said, oh, that's just hypothetical. Of course it's hypothetical. It was illegal. Uh, uh, so that I, that I would suggest to you is the beginning, and really f quite far down the road, to the unraveling of the 1976 settlement. Uh, and that is... Uh, uh, that's alarming. Thank you. Uh, Professor Brandig. Okay, great. Thank you, <coughs> John. I'm here to provide an update on the court's equality jurisprudence, which it addressed squarely equal protection uh, this past term in only one case, that's Schutte versus Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action. This is an opinion that grabbed attention for five different opinions among the justices that answered the fundamental question of what is discrimination? 
And when does racial disadvantage matter, constitutionally speaking? I'll talk about Schuette and then relate it to earlier blockbuster uh, Supreme Court cases on race, and perhaps if I have time, uh, talk about the relationship between the race jurisprudence and some of the cases on sexual orientation. Now, the Schuette case uh, relates to the ongoing struggle over affirmative action in higher education, in particular at the University of Michigan. Uh, recall cases from 2003 where the Supreme Court decided uh, in Grutter and Gratz versus Bollinger that it reaffirmed that while racial quotas are unconstitutional, universities can consider race as a plus factor in admissions. Now, many people embraced this outcome, the split decision in the University of Michigan cases, but some people were unhappy about it. That included Jennifer Gratz, who was the plaintiff in the undergraduate case. Ms. Gratz took her unhappiness to the voters in Michigan, and she prevailed by championing a, a proposal, Proposal 2, that prohibited the use of race in undergraduate admissions and public contracting uh, and in other contexts. Now, you may be interested to know that seven other states have passed bans on affirmative action, most importantly, California in 1996. Also, Washington, Florida, Nebraska, Arizona, New Hampshire, and Oklahoma. Now, Proposition 2 had a tremendous impact on black and Hispanic students or applicants to the University of Michigan. Um, after the proposition passed, only about 5% of freshmen were black and Hispanic um, at Michigan. And this is similar to the impact of these types of propositions at other flagship uh, universities. So at Berkeley, for instance, 2% of freshmen are black. So because of these kinds of statistics, there was a challenge to the proposition, where proponents of affirmative action, this microphone doesn't like me, I'm gonna put it back here. Where proponents of affirmative action lodge a constitutional challenge under the political process doctrine, arguing that the proposition two was a violation of the constitution because uh, proposition two, the process that it led to the passage of Proposition 2, which became a part of the Michigan uh, Constitution, um, had restructured the political process along racial lines and had disadvantaged um, people on the basis of race. Now, at the Supreme Court, Justice Kennedy, in a plurality opinion, along with Justices Roberts and Alito, sustained Proposition 2 against this constitutional challenge. They were joined by Justices Scalia and Thomas, who made a majority um, for the proposition that while the political process had not been restructured in a way that violated the Constitution. I'll focus on the reasoning in uh, Justice Kennedy's opinion um, for why this challenge to Proposition 2 really had to fail. So the framing in this opinion was everything. And the first thing that Kennedy said, he explained what the case was not. Um, it was not an affirmative action case, he said. So Bakke had not been disturbed um, by what the courts did in this case. He also explained that th this was not an intentional discrimination case. So this was not a case um, like Brown versus Board of Education, where there was an underlying entitlement to a right for black and Hispanic students. It's a case about the political process, he said, where the precedents could be construed narrowly or broadly. And surprise, Kennedy uh, determined that those precedents could be, should be construed narrowly. The question is, why should they be construed narrowly? And the answer that Kennedy gave, uh, my interpretation of the answer is this. Essentially, the political process precedents are creatures of the 1960s, of the Warren Court era, where the doctrine related to underlying cases where there was purposeful or intentional discrimination because of race. Uh, 
So cases involving, for instance, housing discrimination, or cases involving school desegregation where there was no challenge to the underlying theory of the case. Kennedy said that the Proposition 2 case was not like that at all. There had not been that type of harm in this case. And the key difference here is that there is no legal <coughs> mandate for affirmative action. So the University of Michigan case, Grutter, that held that race could be a plus factor, merely said that universities could use affirmative action, not that universities must use affirmative action under the Constitution. And I would say it's not just that Grutter is a problem uh, for this theory, this understanding of what discrimination is. It's all of the court's recent cases in the equal protection jurisprudence and in the voting rights cases. So it's Shelby County, um, it's the employment cases involving uh, Title VII, it's K through 12 uh, parents involved uh, where the court said that even a voluntary school desegregation uh, remedy um, was, uh, it was very skeptical of that and it's the Gratz case where uh, the court uh, was clear that anything that looks like a quota um, would not survive constitutional scrutiny. Seven, seven. seven minutes. Well, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the dissent in the case. Uh, so the dissent was written by Justice Sotomayor, who was joined by Justice Ginsburg, lately known as the notorious RBG for her <laughs> outspokenness in a number of cases. <laughs> the interesting thing here is that <laughs> Justice Sotomayor um, framed the case differently. She looked to history to explain why the political process doctrine should in fact cover um, uh, the situation involving Proposition 2. Um, she said that uh, the justices in the plurality and the majority were out of touch on race. She talked about foundational principles in constitutional law, the political process doctrine, but the problem for Justice Sotomayor is that process backs up into substance in constitutional law. Um, and the substantive problem in the affirmative action doctrine is that there is no entitlement to affirmative action. Um, I don't have time to tell you about the sharp back and forth between Justice Sotomayor and Justice Roberts on the question of uh, how to think about discrimination. Maybe we can talk about that during Q&A. Um, but I will say that uh, some proponents of uh, bans on same-sex marriage have looked to the language in the plurality opinion um, to say, to support their position. This occurred in the Fourth Circuit, in the Sixth Circuit. Uh, that uh, move did not work in the Fourth Circuit. That is the idea, uh, if you're going to show deference in the affirmative action context, it should be shown in the same-sex marriage context. That argument didn't work. Um, it, I doubt it's ever going to work for a number of reasons because of the doctrine. Um, in short, the analog for the same-sex marriage context is brown, it's not Bakke, and moreover, judicial values are very different in the context of same-sex marriage. It's a, it's a issue whose, whose moment has come, I think, whereas on the race side, um, there's simply uh, very little acceptance of the idea of race-conscious remedies. So when Justice Sotomayor says that the justice and the majority are out of touch, it really doesn't matter. They don't need to be in touch with her view of race. All they need to be able to do is count to five, as Justice Brennan famously said. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, we'll, not, we'll not hear from Professor Coates. Thank you, John. Um, it, I feel like I'm letting everyone down now because we're going from incredibly important controversial political issues to business litigation, which um, only business litigators actually seem to care about. But I was asked to talk about it, so I'll do my best. <laughs> About 20% of the Supreme Court's docket is business issues, um, cases mostly that most people haven't ever heard of. Um, of that, about uh, a total of 
um, involve securities law, which um, are arguably the, the, the most controversial and dangerous cases for large companies because they typically involve potential damages in the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And so while relatively small fraction of the total docket, very important to Chamber of Commerce, Business Roundtable, general counsels of big companies, and of course the plaintiffs who bring them and the lawyers working for them. The Roberts Court um, uh, has had the highest share of securities law cases since World War II, actually higher than any other uh, under any other chief. But in part, that's only because the docket has shrunk so much. A, a fact about the Supreme Court, just as a general trend, is it takes many fewer cases today than it used to, while preserving roughly one to two securities law cases a year. So while I say it's the highest ever, it's still only one to two cases a year. Um, this year, the court had uh, a case, Halliburton, that had the potential to be the most important case, arguably, in a generation. Um, the business community was very much hoping that it would be the most important case in a generation um, by reversing a longstanding presumption that anyone who buys stock on the stock market relies on the price, which seems like a pretty actually good intuition. Uh, but the business community had done a powerful job of mustering arguments why that should not be, why markets were inefficient, could not be relied on. And you see the irony there, right? The business community <laughs> is arguing against the idea of relying on markets as a way of investors deriving information. Um, had the court gone that way, it would have essentially undone most of the class actions that uh, big companies experience. And the court didn't go that way. The court rejected that. And so it sort of raises the question how to think about the court's jurisprudence in this area when, if you can count to five, I think most people think there's a majority of five on the court who are pro-business, um, the same people who are anti who are against affirmative action. Um, not so happens that, you know, from the same party, um, political party. <laughs> but it turns out it's actually much more complicated in securities when you look at the numbers. Um, the court's jurisprudence is um, actually much less pro-business in this area than was true under uh, Justice Powell. Now, you might be curious, Justice Powell, who's that? He wasn't ever a chief. But in my area, in business area, he actually was far more important than any chief over the past 50 years. He actually managed, as sort of an entrepreneur on the bench, to get a series of slightly different majorities over time to do what the business community wanted. When he was on the bench, securities law contracted. Before he was on the bench, it was expanding. And after he got off the bench, it started kind of more or less treading water. Um, dramatic difference when he was on or off. Under Roberts, it's more or less been continuous with that. That is to say, it's maintained a pretty even split between expansive and restrictive. And so the puzzle really is why, given five Republicans, why hasn't it been more restrictive? <clears throat> I suspect many of Roberts' backers in the Chamber of Commerce are asking themselves the same question. <clears throat> and the answer, I think, has to do with Roberts' background. He's, a, he's an appellate litigator. He's not a transactional lawyer. He didn't spend his time advising companies and helping them predict litigation. He helped them after litigation had already happened, collecting big fees on, on, on behalf of his firm for prosecuting them at the appellate level. And so he has, I think, a very strong predilection for standards uh, and for thinking about procedure and procedural cases as the way to frame a given uh, legal dispute, especially in areas where he frankly doesn't really care. Uh, and I think that's probably true of the entire bench uh, when it comes to securities law. Uh, they don't really care much, um, you know. And therefore, his, his predilection is not to do what the Halliburton um, uh, company wanted, which is to set up a bright line rule to approach securities law cases that would biz benefit business. But instead, in Halliburton, he, he and um, actually the entire court uh, invented a whole new idea, which no one had actually briefed uh, adequately. Um, they also they tend to do this in securities law too. They just make things up on the, as they go um, that were not in the briefs uh, to allow for before class certification the efficiency of the market to be tested, which is completely opposite of what the court had just held two years earlier in Halliburton 1. You might think they would remember Halliburton 1 and follow that precedent here. But in fact, all nine of the justices switched positions on many fundamental topics between Halliburton 1 and Halliburton 2. Um, uh, and instead, used so this procedural device and then framed the test as a very loose standard. Could the defendants prove that the uh, market was sufficiently inefficient to not allow um, plaintiffs to rely on the market price? And right now, there are 
dozens of economic consulting shops sending out memos articulating ways that they think they could best show that. They're all different. They're all going to generate more litigation. And so the one result of this case is not to generally benefit business, nor is it to lean in favor of plaintiffs, but to preserve a fairly loose standard going forward now in a new stage of the litigation, expanding the number of litigation, um, litigations in this area, which is probably exactly the opposite of what um, the business roundtable would like. Um, so I'll wrap up by saying the one exception to this general idea that because they don't care, they preserve standards and uh, uh, generate uh, more litigation through procedural moves is uh, when it comes to corporations intersecting with the topics that Charles and Tamiga were just talking about. That is when corporations, as in Hobby Lobby in this past term, are at the center of a constitutional dispute that has broader political and individual rights uh, implications. What I just, everything I just said falls away. Um, and in fact, if anything, the court gets remarkably predictable uh, in their approach to very complicated corporate law topics. And just to say two words about, how many minutes do I have left here, John? You have one minute and 16 seconds. Excellent, all right. <laughs> just 40. enough time, just enough time to caricature the court, all right. Um, <laughs> Well, but they asked for it. Uh, so in Hobby Lobby, the court applies a broad doctrine to a closely held for-profit company. Um, most of you know about Hobby Lobby, right? I'm not gonna explain the case. And um, the dissent says this is crazy. This, all the same reasoning would apply to every major public company. And the shareholders of Exxon don't have religious things in mind when they buy Exxon stock. And this is just not right. And then the majority says, well, we're not talking about public companies. We're just talking about the case, the court, the companies in this case. And then the government said, we should only limit this to nonprofits, which are established for religious purpose. And the court said, well, we're not, we can't limit it there because there's nothing in the statutes to suggest that nonprofits and for profits should be distinguished. Well, guess what? The same thing is true of for profit publicly held companies and for profit closely held companies. There's nothing in the statute to suggest a distinction there either. The court has and will get, has generated a test which will predictably lead many, many companies of different kinds to come to it, come to the federal courts and ask for exemptions from a whole host, not just the Health Care Act, a whole host of different commands from the federal government. And so once again, this is the one linkage to my earlier remarks, the court is adding to the burden of the federal courts, adding to the number of instances in which for-profit companies are gonna get caught up in the political battles that Charles and Tamik were describing. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. We will now hear from uh, Professor Fallon. Thank you very much, uh, John. So the, what I'm going to talk about, um, my themes are actually entirely consistent with the themes that I've, uh, my colleagues on the panel, I see people, people must know I'm going to talk about federal courts topics because there's a mass rush uh, for the exodus. Uh, but I, um, but the themes that I'm going to develop are roughly consistent with the themes that other panelists have developed um, about the court having one general sort of approach for issues that it cares deeply uh, about and another set, another approach for issues that it doesn't uh, care so much uh, about, whether it's uh, statutory interpretation, uh, as um, Professor Rabb was talking about, or business cases, as Professor Coates was talking uh, about. And so here is the background, as I understand it. Everybody understands that we have a Supreme Court of nine justices that divides along ideological lines with five justices that everybody calls conservative, four justices that everybody calls uh, liberal. Uh, everybody now understands that the five justices who are called conservatives were all appointed by Republican presidents. Uh, everybody that the people call liberals were appointed uh, by Democratic uh, presidents. Uh, and people think that we have a political court. Uh, and I think that we have a court that is aware that the image is abroad in the land, that it is a political uh, court. And I think we have a court, uh, justices of the court, 
who dislike the idea that they are perceived as being ideological and political and divided uh, in that way. And I think some of the things that they do may reflect a strategy of trying to combat uh, that appearance. And to some extent, I think it may just be true, uh, independent of strategy, that the notion of political division does not conform to their self-image of what they uh, do. So self-image may be different uh, from strategy is an explanation. Uh, but um, there seem to be two aspects to the jar charge that the court uh, is a political court. One aspect is uh, that um, they just divide along political lines, uh, and the other aspect is that they are not bound by law in any significant way. They just uh, do what they want to do uh, following their political predilections. And so, court aware of this image, uncomfortable with this image, not having the politics uh, conform to its self-image, what happens? Well, with respect to political divisions, a really striking uh, phenomenon about the Supreme Court's 2013 term was that the Supreme Court was unanimous, unanimous, nine to nothing, in what percentage of the cases would you guess? If you haven't done the research, I'm going to say, I respect it's going to be considerably higher. It's roughly two-thirds of the cases. And some of these cases are cases where it's a phony um, unanimity, because there are five uh, who join one opinion and four who join a concurring opinion that disagrees about uh, as much as um, it uh, agrees uh, about, but striking unanimity more than half the time, way more than half the time, two-thirds uh, of the cases. So the other uh, aspect of the charge that what we've got is a political court is we have a court that is not bound by law, it just does what uh, it wants. Uh, to do. Uh, there were two striking unanimous cases in the Supreme Court last uh, term in which the court seemed to go out of its way to assert that it was more bound by law uh, than previous decisions of the court in previous decades had understood the court uh, as being. Uh, so one of the areas in which the court took this position is the area of standing. So roughly the doctrine of standing is about who is entitled to litigate uh, in an Article III court. For many years, the court has put together uh, complicated rules that it says uh, are uh, embedded in the Constitution about who can sue uh, and who can't sue. But in addition to that, the court for decades, going back to the 1970s, has just routinely recited uh, that in addition to the constitutional rules, it gets to make up some discretionary rules uh, that it has called uh, rules of prudential standing. Uh, and in a nine to nothing case during the past court, dur during the past term, uh, the Supreme Court uh, denied, rejected a claim that it should uphold, uh, that it should uh, reject standing in a particular case on prudential grounds. And more uh, than that said, hey, wait a minute, we're a court bound by statutes in the Constitution. And it used to be the case uh, that the court would sometimes say, uh, we're not going to exercise jurisdiction where the statutes give us jurisdiction in the Constitution. Uh, give uh, us jurisdiction, and we think that those cases were a mistake and we're looking for ways to cut back uh, on them. We're bound, our hands are tied by the statutes and the Constitution by nine to nothing. Uh, they welcomed the idea uh, that their hands are tied. Uh, another similar federal court's uh, doctrine, uh, big uh, cases especially in the 1970s, uh, the Supreme Court used to say that when there are suits against the states and state officials, um, again, the statutes say that there is federal court jurisdiction. The Constitution authorizes uh, federal court jurisdiction. Uh, but back in the 1970s, the Supreme Court said, but we have, we the Supreme Court, uh, have uh, an authority uh, to impose uh, discretionary uh, limits uh, on the exercise of jurisdiction. We're going to establish what the court called abstention doctrines, uh, which essentially held when there's a dispute between the state and state citizens going on in state courts and the citizen goes to federal court seeking an injunction against what's going on in state court that the federal courts will say, uh, no, we're not going to get involved in this. Uh, it's a citizen state uh, matter and the Supreme Court would make up the complicated rules uh, saying when abstention was, constitu was permissible and when uh, it wasn't. So in another case during this uh, past uh, term, the Supreme Court said, well, back in the bad old days, the court uh, wasn't bound uh, by law. 
lot, used to make up these doctrines, saying from time to time federal courts uh, should abstain. But that's not the way this court is. This isn't the way courts uh, ought to behave. We're bound by statutes and the Constitution. Uh, we're cutting back on abstention doctrine uh, way to the core. Uh, and so what's going on in these cases? Well, I don't know whether it's about the court's self-image doesn't see itself as a political court, uh, doesn't see um, itself as unbound uh, by law, or whether it's a strategy. Uh, but I think what you see going on, to connect what I've been saying with what other panelists uh, have been saying, is when the stakes are low, the justices seem to go out of their way to come together, that's the nine to nothing cases, uh, and to insist that they are bound by law. Uh, those are the retreat from prudential standing and retreat uh, from abstention uh, cases, uh, with the result that we have a kind of bifurcated approach and a bifurcated docket between the relatively more uh, important high salience cases where the court looks more political uh, and the other cases on the docket, whether standing cases, business uh, cases, statutory uh, interpretation uh, cases where they want their hands uh, tied. And I think if you want to generalize about what's happening in this Supreme Court, you've got to look uh, at the controversial and the relevant relatively non-controversial parts of the docket and find a way to put the two together. Thank you very much. We have, we have 10 minutes for questions. If anybody would like to ask a, a question uh, or, or, or leave. dash to the door. I, um, we, we do have time for 10 minutes for questions. Any questions? I have way more federal court stuff to talk about if nobody wants to ask a question. We have right over here. So if you, if you would get up and come to the microphone. Yeah, there's a mic. Yeah. How do you think that class action suits have changed in the recent term, if at all? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a quick shot at that. Securities class actions is a subset, um, and essentially they're made more complicated, but no less frequent. Um, beyond securities, if you think about consumer, while not especially salient in this most recent term, over the last several terms, the court has done a great deal to allow for private arbitration agreements to curtail them. So they're essentially going away in any area where companies can um, effectively anticipate the possibility of a class action and build in um, uh, mandatory arbitration and denial of class action in an arbitration uh, setting. And so I predict that, you know, sometime over your lifetimes and the people in this room, that Congress will feel compelled to step in because it, that, it's a recipe for disaster to have effectively no class action remedy in small consumer cases is going to produce some real injustice that eventually will become a political issue, but it'll take a while. In terms of the court uh, tying its own hands um, in less controversial cases, uh, do you think there could be a third reason for that? Like they just want to have fewer cases in front of it, so you know people don't bring those cases anymore. Right. So with respect to the Supreme Court itself, the Supreme Court has almost total discretion over its own docket. And so it's not protecting itself in that way. The Supreme Court essentially doesn't have to hear any case that it doesn't want uh, to hear. Uh, whether the Supreme Court is trying to protect the to protect the dockets of the lower courts, uh, the two hand-tying examples that I gave uh, were both uh, examples in which the Supreme Court tied the hands of the lower courts in a way that required them to accept more cases rather than fewer cases uh, because they are no longer entitled to say, for prudential reasons, we're denying standing. Uh, and there is a set of cases in which they are now uh, precluded uh, from saying, uh, you must, from saying we want to abstain from uh, deciding sensitive disputes. Uh, involving the states, and so the lower courts are now forced to adjudicate those sensitive disputes involving the states. But, but they are sending a clear signal to litigants about what the background rules are, and also to Congress. They're, they're setting a clear baseline against which Congress can legislate. So that may be another element of that as well. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> 
Hi, how are you? I'm Yasin al I'm a 2L, and I just have a question more generally about the realm of affirmative action. So a lot of the socio-psychological debates that kind of analyze the way that we think about affirmative action now, at least from how I've understood it, focuses on this idea that kind of regardless of your class, being a minority kind of in your everyday inflicts upon you a perhaps um, a disproportionate struggle in comparison to the Caucasian majority. And just in terms of thinking about a legal argument that has to address um, that type of component of why there remains advocates for affirmative action in admissions policies, um, how can I think a little bit more about the way that uh, the 14th Amendment might more generally intersect with that type of kind of sociological analysis uh, in support of affirmative action, Professor brown mm. Well, um, that's an interesting question. One that <laughs> in some ways presumes that um, the justices, or maybe you mean the Fifth Circuit, as you may know, there's a, um, a request to hear the Fisher case on Bonk in the Fifth Circuit. I, I think that um, the Fifth Circuit was open to those kinds of arguments. The panel that heard the Fisher case, which is a challenge to uh, race conscious remedies at the University of Texas, perhaps uh, if there's an on Bonk hearing, um, there, there will be openness to that kind of argument. But you know, the conversation between Justices Sotomayor and Chief Justice Roberts is revealing that there is a basic difference of opinion as to whether there are um, too many costs associated with thinking in terms of race. So even if there is disadvantage, there is a block of justices on the Supreme Court who would say that there are too many societal costs associated with separating people in terms of race. So I don't think that they would necessarily disagree um, about the disadvantages every day of um, you know, being a racial minority. They would say that there is a higher um, an issue that is more important as a matter of constitutional law. Um, and moreover, they would um, argue that one has to, in equal protection language, think about individual rights. So the rights of Jennifer Gratz to not be regarded in terms of her race. Um, that, that's the, the way in which the argument would proceed. So I think that there are folks who are responsive to the kinds of arguments that um, you're interested in the implicit bias kind of claims, certainly Sotomayor is, but there is a countervailing interest there. Other questions? Please. Hi, my name is Efren Bonner. I'm a 2L. Um, it seems like gay marriage is almost inevitable um, over the next 10 years, and I would just be curious for any of the panelists whether um, they have any idea about how the court might go about justifying upholding um, gay marriage or having states recognize other states. And then I guess a follow-up for perhaps uh, Professor Fallon specifically, do you think that gay marriage could be a high-profile issue, uh, much like Brown v. Board, where the court feels some sort of pressure to come to some sort of unanimous um, decision on it? So I'll take the last bit first and then leave the earlier uh, part for somebody else so I don't end up uh, talking uh, too much. No, I don't think that the court, I, I cannot imagine the court is currently constituted uh, coming together over uh, gay marriage the way the court uh, came together nine to nothing in Brown against Board of Education. I think uh, that although there may be an emerging national consensus uh, about um, how the states ought to treat gay marriage as a policy uh, matter, I am a good deal less confident that there is an emerging constitutional uh, consensus uh, given uh, some methodological disagreements within the court uh, among other uh, things. And when I was saying that there is pressure for unanimity and the court is self-conscious about not wanting to uh, appear too political <laughs> when the stakes are high enough, uh, I think it tends to be the case that neither side, insofar uh, as you can identify a side, is willing to yield uh, just for the sake of uh, unanimity. And uh, I would just be absolutely, nothing could surprise me more than a <laughs> nine to nothing uh, ruling from these justices uh, about the ultimate constitutionality of state prohibitions against gay marriage. 
On the other hand, I would be greatly surprised if there were a five to four decision, maybe six to three, doing anything else but saying that the gay marriage prohibitions are unconstitutional. And the reason I say that is because the justices get all excited in writing opinions and they get very rhetorical and then the rhetoric comes back and bites them. Uh, uh, Justice Kennedy in the Doma case got very rhetorical at the end about how irrational this is and so on and so forth. And it's very hard to see how that doesn't spill over into uh, the area you're talking about. So. That's one vote, and then of course you have four, and that makes five. Yes, no, he, he, he was asking uh, about <laughs> nine, and very little spills from the pen of Justice Kennedy into the mind of Justices Scalia and Thomas is my uh, impression of the way these things work. <laughs> Other questions? Um, the court decided a couple of relatively high profile technology cases this term in Riley versus California and the broadcasters versus Aereo. Um, and I was wondering what your opinions were on if that's reflective of the court's greater willingness to kind of take on issues of cyber law and technology, or if it's just a fluke and it just they just happen to get them at the same time. Um, because in the arguments and in the decisions, um, the justices, especially Justice Breyer in the Aereo case, seem to really kind of dig into the specifics of the technology. So I was hoping to get your take on that. How could they avoid it? You get uh, sometimes splits in the circuit. You get uh, very important legal questions which can't, just simply just can't get uh, left undecided. The court can't say, well, you know, it's very important, but unfortunately we can't understand it. Uh, they've got to, that's their job. And I think pointing to Justice Breyer is appropriate because he seems to be willing <laughs> to get into the weeds on these things and uh, that gives them a kind of a, uh, a kind of an advantage. So we have time for one very quick question and a very quick answer. All right, please. Uh, possibly clueless 1L question, but it seems in recent decade the court has really focused its role on resolving circuit splits. Is this trend likely to continue in, say, term 15 and beyond, and is it healthy to have one really, really good en banc court? So you guys tell me if I'm wrong who follow the court more, but I think it's actually declined. It used to be, particularly under uh, Justice White, it was a thing. He just wanted all the circuit splits resolved no matter how trivial. And I think it's become much less important to the court selection over time. Is that fair? I, I think it's still the single biggest factor is yeah. whether there's a split in authority. I, mean, I think that's right. There are lots of technical uh, disputes about when there actually is and isn't a circuit split, but when there develops a division that any lawyer would uh, recognize, I think the court does tend uh, about anything of, of significance such that it gets litigated more than once every five years or something of that kind. I think the court does feel a lot of pressure uh, to resolve those circuit splits, and, and well that it should. They can do a lot of damage when they're doing other things. Yeah, they don't, they don't think the law ought to be different in Maine and in Alaska. They mm -hmm. think it ought to be the same all throughout the country. Thank you, thank you to the panel.